Great. Okay, thanks. Thank okay. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Gene Flynn, and I'm delighted to return to the ELA Library. Uh, tonight, we're talking about planning an active retirement, and we have Jim in the room. Hi, Jim. Uh, and uh, two years ago, I was here, and I gave a presentation on planning a trip to Europe. Well, with the pandemic, planning a trip to Europe, you know, we've been on hiatus for visiting Europe. But there's still many, many things that we can be doing in retirement, and that's what I'll be talking about tonight. So uh, just a little introduction. Um, let's see where there's a page down. Okay, uh, this is not advancing here. Did a, mom uh, did a moment ago. Uh, that didn't work either. We have a little technical difficulty, but yeah, we're trying to get work better. Yes. Okay, here, I'm gonna uh, try, I think. Okay. Here. So I did that manually, so maybe we got it now. So um, I've actually retired at least three times, maybe four. So at age 56, uh, I was downsized from my company and it was I was delighted that that happened because I was going to start my own sales training firm. I had been in sales and marketing in my career, working for technology companies, and this was the perfect time to launch that. Well, the effort barely got off the ground, but never really got very hot. So, so that did not work out. At age, uh, so then I went back to working full-time. At age 60, uh, I retired again, and I was teaching half-time at Harper College for seven years, which I really enjoyed. Uh, I was teaching sales and marketing courses. Uh, and then after seven years, I retired from that. And then uh, the, I was going to do part-time consulting at age 67, but that didn't work out. So the message I want to share with you is as you plan things for retirement, everything doesn't work out. You, you might have plans A, you, but we want to have a plan B and consider plan Cs. And if things don't work out, you know, figure out another plan. Uh, one thing that I did not even consider was giving lectures at libraries and senior centers. But I just kind of fell into this because I was part of the Institute of Continued Learning in Schomburg, and I started giving presentations on European travel. And then libraries contacted me and said, could I come and present at the library? So, so unexpectedly, a third something worked out. So uh, there's a couple of goals on this presentation. Welcome. Um, oh, thank you. The, the first one is we're talking about a a planning and launching a retirement and and how do we effectively do that the second part is how do we stay socially mentally and physically active in retirement because i think those are really important uh, as as we uh, as we go through retirement now what we're not talking about is financial planning there's lots of people that give advice on financial planning i, I talk about it a little bit at the end and I'm not talking about Medicare insurance and healthcare insurance. There, there's lots of lectures. I suspect the library has uh, stuff on Medicare planning and uh, Vantage plans and GAP plans. We're not talking about that tonight. There's lots of resources for those kind of uh, that kind of information. Uh, so we're not talking about those. Now, what we are talking about is first of all the stages of retirement to just set up what the issues are, uh, and then. I want to cover some misconceptions about retirement. And then how do we actually plan for what we're going to be doing in retirement to have a to have to enjoy our retirement and uh, staying physically, mentally, and socially active? I'm going to talk a little bit about travel, particularly some international travel issues. And lastly, just a little bit about financing. So the stages of retirement. Uh, you can Google this and get four or 500 different uh, hits on Google. 
And the stages look like this. I, I'm going to try our clicker. There we go. So the first part, the first stage is planning retirement, pre-retirement -plan, pre -re, pre planning. And then the, the retirement occurs. You have that party, and then you're in full mode retirement. And very often, the third stage is disenchantment. That all of a sudden, people, it wasn't exactly what they expected, disenchantment. And we'll, we'll talk about why in a minute. And then stage four is a reorientation. You know, a year, six months, a year later, people resync their expectations about retirement. And finally, they have a stable and a, a, a reconstituted and a stable retirement. So those are the stages. Now, why the disenchantment? There's, there's at least five, and there, there may be 10 reasons. But it, it, and which reasons are more important for individuals? It really depends on their individual situation. But the first one is leaving full-time employment is a major life change. It's right up there with marriage, having a baby, moving to a new house. Retirement is, is a drastic change. Uh, another issue is many of us define who we are by our job. You know, so one moment, the person is the respected manager, that everyone looks up to them and you know wh whether they like them or not or her, they're the manager so they get respect. Then all of a sudden, they're just a regular person. So, so you know, you, you know, so this changing and how they define who they are has been upset. So, a, a, a big factor. Another one is they're le you're leaving a highly structured environment. There's something you know if you're if you're leaving for work at, at 7:30 a.m. or if you're driving to Arlington Park and getting on the 7:56 train to downtown Chicago, that's a, a, a major structure of your life. Well, all of a sudden, you don't have those structures. You don't have that time, 40 or 50 hours a week, that you're dedicated to working and traveling to and from work. So there's lots of time on our hands. Lack of a paycheck can be scary. Even if you have your retirement finances lined up and you have your 401ks and your pensions, but you, if you don't have that steady paycheck, that can be disconcerting. And lastly, uh, and perhaps more important than last but not least, is many of us, much of our friends come from our work environment. And then all of a sudden, you're not working, they're working. So, so the time together and the lunches together and the, those bonds of friendship, you know, they're, they're upset. So, so what do we do about this? The, the alternate view of retirement is, is on this slide. So it, it basically, we still do that stage one pre-planning, but the second stage is rather than cold turkey retirement, I'm suggesting that we, we think about semi-retirement, you know, that maybe we have an encore career or maybe that we volunteer actively so that we have structure and, and meaning in our life. This is what I'm suggesting. Uh, and then over time, we may step away from the, some of that uh, as I did teaching seven years at Harper College gave me a lot of structure. I was gone Monday morning and all day Wednesday, but eventually that ended, but I'd already moved into new structures and new activities. So leaving Harper wasn't a big gap in my life. So, but that's what we're going to be talking about. How, how do we structure those kind of, uh, those kind of transitions? So first of all, I want to cover some misconceptions and there's, there's at least six misconceptions. And I'm going to jump to break them into three. So the first one is that my spouse or my significant other has the same view of retirement that I do. And, and oftentimes that's not the case. Uh, I know people where uh, the wife is eager to do travel, you know, planning trips to London and Paris and he, he wants nothing to do with travel. He wants to be home playing golf and spending time with the grandkids. You know, maybe he traveled for work and he, he, he's done with the, you know, the joys of travel. Uh, so, but, so, you know, and many, there are many scenarios where, the, where the, uh, people, two people have different views of what retirement will entail. So it's important to figure that out and talk through those issues and maybe 
you have a kind of a compromise, you know, that uh, maybe she goes to Europe with her friends, uh, he, you know, stays home with and plays golf, and they have other activities that they enjoy together. So it's a blending different approaches so that it's, uh, so that they recognize the views of the other. Uh, but try to do that early. Don't wait till, you know, you're a year into retirement. Uh, the second one is that my part-time gig will be a big success. You know, I've already mentioned in my case, two out of the three plans that I had crashed and burned. So, uh, so you know, so there's ways that we'll, and we'll talk about how we can improve the odds of success in some of these part-time gigs, but, but the reality is it may not work out. So we wanna be thinking, how do we go with the flow and develop some alternative strategies? Uh, uh, working part-time, the longer, the better. Uh, you know, sometimes people work too long, even when they don't need the money. You know, they, they want to continue working. And, and I think and it, we'll be talking about having an exit strategy so that the, if you have an encore career, you don't necessarily want to do that for 10 years. You know, maybe it's important for the first three or four years to have some structure, but, but think about an exit from that role. And, and we'll talk about that. Uh, the last one, or number four, my hobbies will keep me busy. Uh, while you're working, you may think, oh, I can do 15 hours a week of photography or stamp collecting. Well, after, four, after a couple months of that, you might realize that doesn't keep you busy for 10 or 15 hours a week. Uh, and uh, you know, so the reality might be quite different than what you expect. So you know, figuring that out ahead of time and, and, uh, and, and maybe having a couple hobbies too that you can alternate. Uh, the, the number five, relocating to a different region without due diligence. Uh, Florida is wonderful in the winter, but before you buy a house in Florida, try to spend a summer there. There's a reason that most people from Illinois that are there in the winter leave by the end of April because it gets very hot and humid. So test that out, rent a place. Uh, I know, uh, and even test out different parts of Florida. Uh, I know a couple, they rented, they rented apartments in three different parts of Florida before they decided where do we want to buy. So they, they wanted to make sure that they really were gonna be happy with the whole package that they get in Florida. Uh, another, you know, uh, you, you probably know people, I do, that uh, they moved to Seattle to be near the grandkids. Well, what happens if a year later that the grandkids and their parents move to New Jersey for a job relocation? You know, here you are in a part of the country where you know virtually no one, and the, your reason to be there has gone away. So, so figuring that out ahead of time. Now, now maybe if the parents of your grandchildren are local teachers, teachers tend to stick around. But if they work for a company, you know, a high tech company, relocations are, are sometimes very, very common. So figuring out what are the odds of that type of thing happening. Uh, and lastly, um, uh, the, oh, the last one. You know, sometimes people feel that I can spend more upfront because I'll spend less later in retirement. I'll spend less in my 80s. I'll, I can spend lavishly in my 60s and 70s. Well, the reality is that usually does not work out. Your travel budget may go down later in life, but medical expenses tend to go up drastically. And the, even if you downsize from a house to a townhouse, the, the actual cost and expenses tend not to be that much different in many, many cases. Now, there are probably cases where it is, but, but making the assumption that you can spend more now and later, that can often be a bad assumption. And I think you wanna work with some financial planning to, to test that out ahead of time. So, so the, the next part, part three, planning retirement. So uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things I recommend is thinking about part-time work or active serious volunteering. And, and we'll be talking about this for a couple of minutes. It, it, it adds structure and balance to your retirement. It gets you out of the house. I, I know uh, my wife Mary was delighted that I was gone two days a week. You know, uh, we were newly married at the time as well. 
Um, so it gives purpose to your life. You know, if you're if uh, if you're doing something meaningful that's helping people, that that gives meaning, uh, and potentially can increase your income. So uh, some of the ways of part-time work, there, there's a number of options. Uh, one is working for your current employer. You know, many companies, it, uh, if you're re if you're approaching retirement, you might have a wonderful set of skills that are still in demand by your company. I, I know some people, they, they know the code and the information technology of the systems that are 30 years old. And all the new employees, they don't want to touch a system that's 30 years old. There, there, there's no future in that. However, if you have those skills, you might be able to just work a deal to say, I'll work you know, 20 hours a week, uh, reasonable compensation. Uh, so that, those kind of uh, opportunities could well exist. Uh, but uh, there's many others. You can do contract work. If, if you have financial skills, information technology skills, HR skills, uh, many people can get contract employment gigs for, for four months, six months, eight months. And then at the end of that, you have no more obligation. Maybe you sign up for another contract role, but, but it, it, it's a short duration. It's a, a, a clear uh, duration that you've signed up for. Um, the, uh, one of the things I encourage you to do is try, try all these kinds of uh, uh, opportunities while you're still working. Now, obviously, you can't take a contract role if you're already working full time in information technology. But, but I taught part time at College of Lake County uh, so that I knew, gee, I like teaching at a community college. So that after I did retire, getting a, a role at Harper College, I knew odds are I would do fair, I'd do well at it, and I would enjoy it. So, but I test drove even while I worked. Uh, and maybe you can do that even if you're volunteering as in a role, you know, to, you know, to see how you like that kind of environment. Uh, there's lots of tips on encore careers. Uh, here's some great books uh, that, and I'm sure the library has a number of books on encore careers. Scott's uh, not even that, 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 you know. So these books uh, give you advice on how do you line up encore careers, what you should expect and uh, can, can give you references and give you great suggestions. Uh, uh, you know, so ideally, you're matching your skill skill set and your interests so that, it, that, that they're lined up, that you'll enjoy doing this as, a, a, as an encore part-time career or limited time period career. Uh, try to research it while you're doing it. Uh, and again, consider volunteering. Uh, also realize the income that you get might be quite different than when you were working full time. You might, if you were a, a, a chief financial officer at a corporation and you want to do that for a volunteer for a nonprofit, the pay scale might be drastically different. So, uh, but you want to do it probably for more than just the money. You want to probably do it because it's it's a good cause that you believe in. Uh, a couple examples. Um, my brother-in-law is in Minneapolis. And he and four, three other friends retired about the same time. And they, they created a little consulting firm. And uh, each had a different focus. Uh, my brother-in-law had a finance, like a CFO role. There was an IT role. There was a marketing role and an HR role. So four individuals, four different roles. Uh, so they went out there, but they marketed themselves and they landed opportunities. Uh, but looking you know, four or five years later, the results were quite different. So the H, the finance, the HR, the, the information technology and the finance guy averaged billings of about 18 hours a week, where the marketing and the HR guy only had billings of about six hours a week, six to eight hours a week. But each one of them had to spend about six hours a week promoting their, you know, trying to land new opportunities. So, so one, you know, so basically, you, you know, the, the two guys, two of the guys were working 25 hours a week and two were working uh, 13 hours a week. But, uh, but so, but very different results. And, and, and that's based on probably supply and demand. You know, the demand for a finance consultant was much higher. Uh, but you realizing you, if you're doing these kind of roles, you have to continually market yourself. Um, 
planning an exit strategy. Uh, some people work too long, and I nearly fell into that trap. I was teaching at Harper for seven years. I was teaching seven or eight courses a year. Now, the full-time faculty taught 10 courses a year, but they had committees and they had other office hours. They had other responsibilities. So, so, but I was teaching seven or eight courses a year. And I started my retirement annuity as, a, as an employee. You know, as, you know my, my annuity was like 200 bucks a month. You know, nice, li nice little gift. Uh, however, the state of Illinois passed a law that said if you started your annuity, you could only teach one course a year at the community college. And initially, I was just very annoyed at this because I was teaching seven or eight courses and they, I could only teach one. And, and it really wasn't even worth teaching one to lock myself up for 16 weeks just for one course. Uh, but after I got over my anger, I really realized they did me a favor, that it really seven years was enough to be teaching at the community college. You know, I'd already had many other, uh, many other uh, activities in my life, I really didn't need that structure anymore. So, so they, in, in hindsight, they did me a favor. And, and I see this a, a, a number of ways. Uh, my wife, Mary, uh, was a teacher in the public schools. And, and many administrators in public schools, I'm not sure if it's you know, here in your district, but, but in the Palatine district, uh, they are often asked the uh, administrators, can you come back we need you as an assistant principal, or we need you in this role or that role. So, so these individuals that already have a very nice pension, they come back and they work uh, 100 or 150 hours, 150 days a year. But it's so attractive because the money is so good, they, they stick with it year after year after year, and they don't leave it. And, and many people put off the fun things of retirement because they, they, they like being a principal or an assistant principal, but, but they put off their, their retirement. And then eventually, you know, we've known stories where people then get ill and they never took that dream vacation that they planned or that, you know, buying that house in, in, you know, in Hawaii. So, so, so the, the goal here is think through how do you exit if you're in a role. Now, another friend of ours, uh, she, she was a, a volunteer at Lutheran General Hospital. And this lady was so capable, three or four months after she started volunteering, they asked her to, as a paid full-time employee, to run their three daycare centers. And she did. And she did a great job at that. But after three years, she said, I've had enough. Good luck. And that was very wise because running daycare centers is not an easy task. Uh, and so, so she was smart enough to exit that role. And that, that's something I encourage you to think about. Okay, now, so there's, you know, there's paid gigs, but there's also serious volunteer work. And I wanted to talk about that for a few minutes. Uh, the first is you could take a totally new role. Uh, and the second one is you could use your past experiences in a, in a do something similar to what you did at your work life. But, but let's look at the first one first. Uh, my brother-in-law was a lawyer for the Union Pacific Railroad. Uh, and uh, and uh, after he retired, he went and became a very active volunteer at the Illinois Railway Museum in Union, Illinois. And, and he was a totally per, a different person. You know, this guy that was a serious lawyer, he loves running the inner city trolley that we see in the picture here. And, and he'd have his trolley cap on and he'd, he'd talk and chat with the kids on the, on the trolley. It, it, it just, it, it changed his whole personality. It was just amazing. Uh, and he, he just enjoyed it very, very much. Uh, another fellow I know was a surgeon, med, uh, MD, medical doctor surgeon, and he became a chaplain. You know, he went to chaplaincy school and he's still in the hospital, but he is, he is a chaplain and, and a chaplain not only to the patients, but to the doctors and, and to the staff at the hospital. I mean, so it's a, it's a, you know, a life changing role that he has. Uh, now other people can reuse and use their work experience. Uh, I volunteer at the Barrington Career Center for helping people in job search. So uh, sometimes we have people that were HR professionals at work, they come and volunteer and 
you know, as an HR professional, they know about job seekers and landing jobs and interview skills. It, you know, so they're just applying the skills that they've had in their workplace to their volunteer role. And uh, another fellow I know, uh, he was a construction manager, and now he manages the construction for the Habitat for Humanity, uh, for the, the homes that they're remodeling. So all of these things want to give you ideas to think about different roles that you might take. Uh, here's, uh, here's the Habitat for Humanity. That's the, the, that's the home in Elgin that they were remodeling. So, uh, and everyone's welcome to, you know, you don't have to know how to build a home. Uh, they will find a role for you, even if it's moving lumber around from one part to the other. And, uh, uh, and, if, and if you can't do that outdoors, you could work at their, re at their resale shop. So, so they're always looking for volunteers. Typically, one day a week, they're looking for you to volunteer. Uh, their SCORE is another organization of people that have business skills that, that volunteer to help nonprofits and small businesses uh, uh, improve their success. So uh, now SCORE, I checked with them recently, the SCORE for Cook and uh, Lake County, they have more volunteers than they need right now. But if you want to, North Cook and Lake County, they have the volunteers. But if you want to volunteer here, the city of Chicago score, they're looking for volunteers. And the, uh, the Fox Valley score organization, they're looking for volunteers. So, so again, there's a supply and demand aspect. You might have an interest, but if the demand isn't there for your role, you need to be uh, on the lookout for a different role. A um, couple more points. Sometimes people hesitate to volunteer because they don't want to be locked into a commitment. Uh, and, you know, the, like Habitat, they expect you Wednesday to be the day, you know, five hours of volunteering on Wednesday. So some people hesitate to that. And, and I'd encourage you to think about doing it anyways. You may find that it's so much fun, you really enjoy doing it, and you're happy to make that commitment. Or if it's not working out, you can say, I've tried this and it's not working out. So thank you for the chance to volunteer. You're not signing up for a two-year commitment when you volunteer. You know, they realize it's not for everyone and, and people try it and sometimes it doesn't work out. So, so I, I'd encourage you to try something. Don't hesitate. Um, now, finding volunteer opportunities. It's, it's not... It, 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 you know, this is this this is a serious issue because uh, you may have an interest, but figuring out where can you apply that interest and in skills, you can be checking out by word of mouth, finding people that uh, are volunteering now. Uh, you could the library might have some advice. They may have volunteers at the library. Some libraries have volunteers, uh, but religious congregations often know of, they need volunteers themselves, or they could suggest. Where, where their members volunteer at. You know, it's a, a way to connect local schools. You can even Google Chicago volunteer opportunity. And, and you might get six or 700 hits on Google, but, uh, you know, but narrow your search to tie into your skill set. So, so moving on to part four, staying physically, mentally, and socially active. Uh, so uh, they're going to look at the same physically active first. Uh, there's lots of organizations that can uh, help you uh, and, you know, lots of activities. You know, I, here I list eight or nine, pickleball, tai chi, yoga, uh, lots of organizations, the YMCA, the park districts, health clubs. Uh, uh, exercise improves your mood. It helps you manage your weight. Uh, and the Health and Human Services Organization of uh, the federal government suggests 75 to 150 minutes a week of exercise. And, and the 75 is if it's an active exercise. 150 is minutes is if it's walking is a wonderful exercise, but you need to walk longer to get the same benefit as if you were, for example, running or playing tennis. Uh, uh, I'd encourage you to think about structure as you look at activities. Uh, it, uh, it's, it, you know, as you retire, if you like golf, you could say, I'm gonna play golf regularly. But I think it's better if you join a golf league. 
and uh, there are many golf leagues in the area. Uh, I just rejoined the Palatine Hills Golf Association and they play on Thursday morning. Uh, there's also uh, at Palatine Hills, there's also a Monday morning senior golf uh, uh, opportunity. But, but being part of an organization, uh, it's valuable because you're meeting the same people. Uh, one of the guys I met playing golf, uh, we talked about traveling to Ireland and you know, now we're good friends. We, uh, we, we share other activities together. So, uh, so you know, if, if you're meeting the same people regularly, you, you tend to form additional social bonds. So, so be, you can talk, almost any golf course will have some opportunities that, that you can target that, uh, uh, that, that can fit into a time and skill set uh, that, that you are aiming for. Uh, there are many other activities. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, it could, because as opposed to exercising alone at home, you, you could buy ellipticals and treadmills, but, but if you're doing this in a social context, it's giving you, I think, double power. And uh, hiking clubs, uh, bird watching clubs, walking with neighbors, dancing. Uh, Hoffman Estates, uh, uh, be, at least before the pandemic, they have a monthly dance uh, uh, event where people could come uh, you, and they teach you to dance. You could learn the foxtrot or other dances, but, but you're in a social context having fun. I think the entry fee was $5 and you had potato chips and soda on the house. I mean, so, but, but, that's a social activity, which makes it much more powerful. Uh, I'd encourage you to think, as you think about exercising, uh, so I belong to the LA Fitness here in Lake Zurich. And then I also belong, I, I have belonged to the YMCA, not the one in Lake Zurich, but the one in Palatine. And in my experience at, at, at LA Fitness type organizations are, it's wonderful equipment. You go there, people work out alone and leave and maybe they wave to the person at the counter. Very little social interaction. My experience at the YMCA is that people that are you doing yoga together, they, they sit around and uh, maybe have coffee at the uh, snack shop afterwards. You know, so that, that's really, it, it, there's a much greater social interaction among the members. And uh, so uh, it, uh, to me, that was what I saw was very, very real. And I suspect it's in the, uh, here at the Foglia Y here in Lake Zurich as well. Uh, pickleball. Uh, I, the, uh, I played pickleball this morning. Uh, the Palatine Picklers, uh, it, it's actually, uh, they have over 900 members. And, and you, you, it's hard to see all these individuals, but many of these people are retired. You know, they, they play Monday, Wednesday, and Friday morning indoors. Uh, and uh, there's also a dedicated pickleball arena uh, outdoors in Palatine with six courts. So it, it, you know, so pickleball, it's not near as intense as tennis. You're not running around as much. So, so it's ideal uh, for people in their retirement planning. Uh, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, now staying mentally active. Uh, you could be doing puzzles at home, crossword puzzles. Uh, you could be watching the History Channel and uh, you know, they have wonderful stuff on the History Channel. However, I think it's much better if you add a social uh, co uh, context to your uh, mental activities, like bridge, playing with other people, or joining a learning community. And uh, learning communities, uh, there's many, many opportunities. Uh, uh, my wife, Mary, she was took courses in French at Harper College. And, uh, uh, and she, she took French one, two, and three, and she, she took French years ago in college, but she took French one, two, and three, and four, and she was with another group that loved this so much, they took French two, three, and four again. They almost continuously took the same courses, and if you're over 65, it's actually free at Harper, and probably at College of Lake County, uh, but it, you know, the, the, the people in the French class actually became a community. And uh, so they joined the Palatine Sister City Organization, which is, uh, has a French connection. So, you know, so you know, bonds of friendship emerged from uh, the Sister City Organization. This picture is uh, Mary and I joined one of the, uh, the two other ladies uh, in France. They, uh, we, we, we took a, they were uh, taking an immersion course. So Mary and I went over there to spend some time with them. Uh, 
we, I'm also very active in the Institute of Continued Learning, which is a lifelong learning group in Schomburg. And uh, it's, you know, where, where, where we have classes in history, music, travel, uh, we play bridge together. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, four, 300 people that are interested in lifelong learning, but without tests or homework or assignments. And you don't even take attendance. If you don't come to a class, nobody worries. It's a, but it's a fun way to learn. And it's surprising the number of people that hated history in high school, and they find it just fascinating as an adult to uh, learn about the Civil War or the Rome or the Middle Ages. Uh, it's, it's a fun where people share ideas and have great discussions and form friendships. You know, it's it, 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 it learning in a social context. Uh, there are many other opportunities of, along those lines. Uh, I mentioned Harper College, College of Lake County has one, Northwest University has a, a, a lifelong learning group. Uh, many high schools have a continuing education aspect. So there's lots of opportunities to consider this. And, and the beauty of this area, there's so many riches of opportunity. Uh, I've done lectures up near the Wisconsin border and, 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 and most peop many people up there have to drive down to Lake Zurich or south to get to some of the opportunities that are right in our neighborhood here. So it, it, we, we really have a wealth of opportunities for this kind of opportunities. So hobbies, it, there's so many, I, I just listed a bunch of hobbies here, uh, genealogy, photography, book clubs, the library I'm sure has several book clubs, uh, gardening, uh, learning to play the piano. It, 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 uh, I've started that, I'm, I'm still at level one, but, but I enjoy level one and I can play the John Denver songs that I, that I know and love. Um, now, a couple suggestions though. Uh, testing your interest in a hobby or an activity is, is uh, advisable. So you may think that an, you know, traveling the country in an RV is wonderful, uh, but I encourage you to rent one before you buy the RV. You know, test it out, you know, spend, you know, even if you're retired, rent an RV for a month. Uh, see if you like living in those small uh, closed containers. The, uh, some people hate it and uh, two or three months later, they're selling their RV. Uh, other people we know have upgraded from one level RV to a second, to a third. They, they've moved up to have bigger and bigger RVs because they enjoy it so much. So, so it's, it's important, I, I encourage you to test it out. Now, much as testing out Florida before you, uh, before you commit to a location. Now, uh, staying socially active. And first of all, I think women do a better job of staying socially engaged than men. Uh, I, in my experience is women talk to each other and check in with each other much better than men. And that men, my, my friends call me when there's something to do. They don't just call to check in. They, they say, let's play golf or let's, uh, let's, do, uh, uh, let's go to a concert. It's, it's, it's activity focused discussion rather than just that, you know, how are you doing? We're just checking in on you. Uh, and another aspect, many people over 50 feel I'll never make new friends. You know, I have my friends from earlier times, but the reality is you can make new friends, but you have to, I think, find a social activity to foster those new friendships. Uh, now, some, some suggestions on activities, finding a community of volunteers, uh, uh, a community of learners, I've, I've talked about that. Joining sports activities, pickleball as, a, as an example, uh, and check out senior organizations. And uh, I know I personally had a bias against senior organizations. I say those are for old, old people. And uh, so, but, but check, I'd encourage you to check this out. Some, some uh, senior centers are very laid back and very quiet. Uh, others are uh, bursting with activity. Uh, the Arlington Heights Senior Center, for example, uh, they have a craft room where, where people are working crafts. They have a wood a woodworking room where they have all these saws and lathes and you know all the, all this equipment for you to build the birdhouse of your dream. Uh, they also have a library. They have lectures. They have a pool table. 
it, it just bursting with activities. And, uh, and if you go to one senior center and it's too, too quiet for you, check out another one because some of them are, uh, some of them are much more uh, active than others. Um, singing is, is a great way to uh, inter, uh, have, be, be socially engaged. Um, Arlington Heights, they have a barbershop a quartet group called the Arlingtones. Um, I, I, I don't know about your park district, uh, Palatine Park District, uh, they have, a, uh, the, uh, they have a, a group that sings. All are welcome. You don't have to be able to read music, you, uh, but it's a, it's a service event. The park district here might well have something similar, or the, the, the high school might support this. Um, talk, I want to talk a, a few minutes about travel, op, uh, travel opportunities and issues. Uh, the first is uh, I'd encourage you to travel, do, do more strenuous travel younger, uh, earlier in your retirement. If you want to be climbing Mount, uh, uh, a, a, a climbing hills in, uh, uh, in Arizona, do that uh, earlier uh, or traveling to Europe. Uh, Europe, is, uh, we've traveled to Europe many times. Uh, in, in Germany, the, at the train stations, the elevators and the escalator, escalators always work. In Italy, it's like 50-50. You might be, so, so in Italy, if you're traveling, you might be carrying your suitcase up, you know, 15 flights of steps. And then going to another, you know, and, and sometimes you're at the train waiting for it to come and they say, oh no, we're going to, you're at track two and they say the train is coming in on track four. So you're running down those 20 steps, moving over, climbing up another 20 steps to get to track four. So it, uh, so that takes some physical stamina and, and if you have bad knees, that's gonna be a problem. So, so do, but do that earlier. And you could also be doing research to figure out where the, uh, if, if there are mobility issues, where are the subways that work uh, well for you? Uh, in Munich and Vienna, all the subways have escalators and elevators. In Paris and London, those subway systems are over a hundred years old. There are, some of them are 120 years old. They may eventually have elevators there, but, but it, it may be another 20 years. So, so, but you can look online to say, where are the stops in London where there is an elevator or an escalator so that you could have that as your base for a hotel nearby. So, but planning that stuff ahead of time, the internet allows us to, to get very detailed information. Uh, and there's lots of travel group options. Uh, I know uh, uh, the high school district 214 in Arlington Heights, they have a very large travel club. So, so you could be traveling with them uh, as a couple or just as a single, and they're going, uh, uh, they're planning now more and more trips to Europe. Uh, so, so many opportunities. Uh, but for travel, there's some things that we wanna be careful of. We wanna know our physical limitations. If you're signing up for a, a, a trip in Northern Spain where you're, uh, where you're, you're expected to do a hundred miles in, five days, you know, that's 20 miles a day. And if, if you've never walked more than a mile locally, you really want to make sure that you can get up to speed to do the, you know, the do the 15 or 20 miles a day. Otherwise, you're, you'll probably just be put into a truck, you know, to haul to the next uh, the rest stop. And that's not fun. So you, you so plan, you know, so that, so that the physical requirements of the trip and the tour match what you can do. Uh, good shoes, wear good shoes, pack light. Uh, if you know you don't want to be lugging a large suitcase if you're using the trains in Europe or you're walking through the cobblestone streets. It, it uh, it'll wreck your shoulder, and it, uh, uh, you want to travel light. Uh, Mary and I will go to Europe for three weeks with a, a carry-on suitcase. We we pack light. Uh, essentially, everything I wear can be washed in the hotel sink. And it will be dry for the next day. So, but uh, and who cares if you're wearing the same black outfit five days in a row? People, you know, you're not going to see the same people typically. Uh, now, there are exceptions to this. If you're taking a Viking River cruise, uh, then most people fly into the town. You know, maybe fly into uh, Amsterdam. They pick you up at the airport. They bring you to the ship. 
you take your five or ten, you know, 10 day trip and then they bring you back to the airport and you fly home. It, it, in that case, you could have a big suitcase. But, but if you're traveling uh, on your own, if you're taking trains, you want to pack light. If you have a big suitcase, it's going to be sitting in your lap if the train is crowded. If there, are, there are not luggage cars anymore on these European trains. It's, it's in your lap or it fits into an overhead bin, but it's only if it's a, a carry-on size bag. The last point here, uh, I've done research because I give talks on European travel and, and I've gone on to the website of the people that provide travel insurance. And, uh, and it's interesting to see what they say are the cause of most of the claims. And, and near the top of the list is people doing things on their trip that they would never do at home, like riding a motorcycle. Somehow people get in their head, they're in, you know, they're in, uh, uh, the, they're in the Bahamas so that you should ride a motorcycle. Well, if, if you're not used to a motorcycle here, you're likely to get into, it's quite possible you're gonna get into trouble with a motorcycle in a foreign country. Um, you, you know, people in Egypt love to, you know, take camel rides, but and it, isn't it nice to go pet the nose of the camel? Well, a camel is likely to bite you if you pet their nose. So, you know, so things, you know, to, you know we wanna be careful at, when we get involved, it, you know, people eating exotic food and they wind up in the emergency room. And, you know, figuring out ahead of time so that we're not just because we're traveling, we're not taking much higher risks than we than we would at home. Um, a few more things on international travel. One is Medicare it doesn't work outside the U.S., so so you need a plan for your health insurance, and uh, most uh, and you don't necessarily have to buy tr specialized travel uh, medical insurance. Uh, most Medicare gap policies or the uh, Advantage plans have an option for, uh, include international travel. Uh, but particularly the Medicare gap policies, you know, plan A and B, because they're all standard plans, A and B may not have international, may perhaps not, but E and F do, do have international travel. So, you know, so you might be paying five bucks a month more, but, but you have uh, uh, coverage for the international, any international travel. So bring along a list of your prescriptions. Uh, I can't stress that enough. And, and particularly in generic form. Uh, we, we've been in situations in Spain where we forgot one of our medicines at home. But going into a pharmacy in, with our generic name and we uh, talking to a person that does not speak English, which uh, you know in Germany and France, most pharmacists will speak English in Spain that's not necessarily the case. So, so, but we pointed to our name of the generic drug and the pharmacist went back, came out with a, you know, a two week supply and it, it cost $4. Um, so, so you know, in Germany, they might say, we have to call your doctor, but perhaps not. Pharmacists in foreign countries have different roles and responsibilities than US pharmacists. They, and sometimes they can diagnose certain conditions and give you a prescription on their own. So, it, so pharmacies are important, but uh, so the, the last, I, I talked a little bit on researching the transportation options. So it's easy to do. Uh, we've rented apartments and homes in Europe a number of times, uh, traveling alone or with friends, uh, but we do research to make sure that we're in a safe area and we are in an area that has good local transportation to get to where we want to be, to, to visit. So lastly, I uh, wanted to say a few words on financing, finances, financial matters. The first is we have to recognize that people are living longer. Uh, so if you are an average, uh, if you are a 65 year old woman in the US, statistically you will live to 85 and a, a man will live to 84. However, you can Google a life expectancy calculator and, and then you put in a bunch of parameters. It, it asks you, do you smoke? Uh, are you overweight? Are, are you diabetic? You put in these parameters and very and quite possibly it will say you will likely live to 92. So at 65, you could well have another 
close to 30 years. On, on, and, and when we're talking about an average of 91, that means half the people are gonna live longer than 91. So, so there's, there's a range here. So, so figuring out how do we uh, ensure that we have the overall financial capability for, for that longer life. Uh, and, you, so, and that means you wanna make sure that your dreams and your available money are somewhat aligned. You know, that uh, if you're, uh, you know, you're making sure that there's some commonality to that, some harmony. Uh, and many retirees are better off financially than they realize. Now, in, in, the, in the cold, you know, moving into retirement, many people feel I'm not going to have enough money. But if you get over that initial uh, trauma of retiring, uh, you, you, know, you really can figure out maybe you do have uh, more than you realize. Um, I was in a, in a lecture recently, and the professor was saying, to, talking to his mom in California, and he said, Mom, you should be traveling more and uh, having fun. She was uh, in her early 80s, and she said, I don't have the money. And he said, you're sitting in a million-dollar house, which, which in California is not unusual. You know, in San Francisco and Burbank, you know, homes, it's incredible how... Uh, but, but he said, you could sell that house, move into a you know, rental apartment, and, and you'll have plenty of money to travel uh, and do other fun things. So, so figuring out what the real situation is, is very important. And, and part of that is all developing a financial plan with somebody that you trust. Uh, and, and a financial plan, in my opinion, should include not only what your investments look like and, and how to diversify your investments, but how much you should be spending. Um, a friend of ours paid her financial advisor $4,000 for a financial plan, and it spoke nothing about what she should be spending, how much or how little. And to me, that's malpractice. You, 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 know, you want to be looking not only at your diversity of your investments, but also how, what is your spending levels and what will give you the, the, the wherewithal that you need for your expected life expectancy. Uh, so uh, lastly, uh, you know, too many people put off the fun stuff of retirement. And so I encourage you, you know, as it kind of the theme here is uh, have fun in retirement. Find things that you, that you want to do as part of your retirement. Uh, and there are many great organizations uh, that are free or uh, modest cost. Uh, I know, you know, you, you could go and have a two-week trip uh, in London and spend twenty thousand dollars, or you could do it and spend you know three or four thousand dollars, and and uh, I mean you're not going to be staying at five star hotels at that lower price range, but you, but you can really have just as much, in my opinion, just as much fun, and uh, uh, but you know, so you know how much you spend and how much fun you have are not necessarily highly correlated, so so figuring out what you want to do. And, and the final message here is plan your retirement, live your retirement. Other people might say you should be doing this or that in your retirement. And you know, maybe you listen to them, but it, it's your retirement. You should figure out what you wanna do and live your retirement, not someone else's dream of their retirement. It's a, you know, many people give us advice in life and uh, you know, consider it advice, but figure out what you want for your successful active retirement. So uh, that's it. Uh, and I know Scott, we've had uh, uh, an opportunity to uh, 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 questions or comments from uh, uh, no, uh, let the, take their questions. So, so Jim, uh, and, uh, I, and do you have any questions or comments in the room? Oh, um, can I Absolutely. Oh, okay. um, I just I was curious, you had mentioned the um, Burlington Career Center and the SCORE organization. Yes. Do those involve cost, and then do they actually pay somebody who might be interested in just asking about businesses, you know, or is it just like a one-time consulting? Um, okay, so there's, okay, so there's, okay, great question. So there's many, uh, so there, there's many organizations that can help people that are in job search or that are in career planning changes. So, so the Barrington Career Center, uh, it's a, a one-time, an annual fee of $200 uh, to take, uh, I think they have 15 different workshops. You have an individual coach, you have uh, teams, 
So, so that, that's one opportunity locally. Uh, there's uh, the state of Illinois has a group in Arlington Heights that is a job, job search. Uh, the library might have uh, some job support ad advisors too uh, as well. So you could talk to Scott about that. Uh, but there, there's lots of opportunities to get uh, to get a, you know planning, whether it's a career change or a job search. Not at, no, not at all. People are they're very they're very welcome to. Uh, uh, it, it, it's not limited to Arlington. The Arlington Heights one is not limited to Arlington Heights. And, and to me, that's a world class group. You know, the, uh, there's a, there's a senior center here in Lake Zurich uh, that you could check out as well. But uh, my guess is they're not going to have a woodworking shop, or uh, they, maybe they have a billiard table. But uh, you know, uh, you know. Yeah, it, it, you know, woodworking is, uh, that's amazing that they have that. All right, we do have one from uh, the chat. It says, you mentioned high school 214 travel group. They want to know if that is for seniors or multi-generational. Multi-generational, yes, multi-generational. I was looking at them today. They're, they're having a, a 10 day trip to Scotland uh, in 2023. Jim, Jim, any questions or comments? You mentioned something about a learning uh, organization. Yes. Where would I find more information about that? Okay, I, I have a little brochure right here. I'm glad you. I'm glad glad you asked. So you, uh, and it's it's right in Schaumburg, right by the Costco, not the Lake Zurich Costco, but the Costco and the IKEA. It's right by the IKEA in Schaumburg, and uh, it's it's a great partnership because we basically can have. Uh, Five, four or five classrooms in the morning and early afternoon, and the evening. Uh, Roosevelt is much busier with uh, with students, but uh, with the lifelong learning group, uh, it's open for people fifty five and older. And also, Jane, we have a follow up to the high school question: uh, Is the high school two fourteen group uh, that information available on the website of the high school? Uh, yeah, I, I I'm sure it is. Uh, you could it would if you went to the the but you could uh, you could Google District Two Fourteen Travel Group and okay. and that will pop up. I will do that and send the link. Uh, because you could also do District Two Fourteen under Continuing Education, that will take you to the same web pages. Okay, yeah, Continuing Education. Yes, and the district here in Lake Zurich well might have a Continuing Education programs as well, perhaps even with a travel group. Hopefully we can get back to some international travel, but but there's so much of the U.S. to see. Uh, uh, one of the things that Mary and I planned was to do the Europe stuff early, uh, because U.S. travel is much more predictable. You can get to the airport, you could land, the elevators all work, or the escalators. You can get into a car, drive to the Grand Canyon, or you know, national parks or uh, other sites, and. Uh, uh, it, it's much easier, even if there's some mobility issues. But th there's a whole world out there. Okay. Yes. Oh, be, between the couple? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, trying to get on the same page. You know, I, I think th that's a great question. I think one of the things is trying to figure out what are the things that you like to do uh, that might uh, coincide. You know, like like uh, perhaps pickleball, where uh, you know it, it, you know one member might be an avid golfer. Golf is relatively difficult to pick up, so you know, getting up to speed in learning golf, it's possible. But some things like pickleball, it's very easy to uh, to learn that and to be uh, to enjoy that together, and uh, and I think 
the same is true uh, for travel. You know, uh, you know, even while you're working, you could be trying a trip to, uh, uh, you know, you know, you, it's very easy to take a, like a one week trip to London or to Paris and see, do you like international travel? Uh, and some people really, you know, they really love that and want to do more. Other people say, you know, it's so crowded, you know, uh, or for whatever reason, they say, well, let's, let's not do international travel, but let's do another type of uh, maybe travel locally and, uh, you know, with hiking and things like that. So, so it's finding, experimenting to see what, what works for, for a couple. I, I think that's really up to the couple. What what's the right blend? But uh, but I think it, it. I think the key is finding things that, that you that you're comfortable doing alone or with friends, and then doing having other groups things that you like doing together. So in in that uh, you know, so finding what's the right blend that works for you. Uh, you know, I think that'll be very individualized. I know, I know uh, Mary sang with the Chicago Master Singers. So every, uh, every other year, we would go to Europe with the Chicago Master Singers. And, and typically, the, most of the women were, uh, were the sopranos and the altos, they were traveling, their husbands stayed at home. Most of them, a few came, I came along, I was a groupie. You know, but uh, where others, uh, you know, but some, some people are much more comfortable in new and different social environments. Well, we've traveled with other couples, you know, and they, they were, you know, they were very much out, like he would be very much outside his comfort zone in international travel. And, and, and figuring out where are, how, how broad are, or narrow are your comfort zones. And, and I think some of that you can only experience by doing and to see how, uh, how, uh, how comfortable people are doing new things. And certainly in Europe, there's lots of unexpected things that can occur. Almost every trip, there'll be something unexpected. You get to a hotel and they say, we're booked up. We, I know we have your reservations, but we're all booked up, but we put you in a hotel a block away and we'll, we'll carry your luggage down. Now, now, some people would get very, very upset with that you know, because it never happens in the US or, or would rarely, but, but, you know, those kinds of things in Europe happen fairly regularly. But, you know, so, you know, so it's important to be able to go with the flow and, and not let something like that detract from enjoying your trip. And I suspect the same thing that happens in, in many different international travel situations, you know, that, you know, but in getting lost, but getting lost can be part of the fun, you know, if you're getting lost in rural Ireland. Anything else coming in, Scott? Uh, everyone enjoyed the program. Everyone was very happy. Great. The sound was great. The slide was great. Um, if you could get copies of those slides, I'm going to send them to everyone. Uh, absolutely. We'll do that. Okay. Excellent. Uh, so, yeah, no, I don't see any other questions. Great. Uh, well, I think we're right on time. Uh, but it, we're delighted. Uh, uh, hopefully, you, uh, you, you've learned a few things. Uh, I usually say on these kinds of sessions, Hopefully you've learned a few new things and that some things that you've heard before that you'll actually believe and try out, you know, because much of this you may have heard before, but, but, uh, but to actually give it, some, uh, give it some thought to see if you could really apply it rather than just hear it. So, so thank you again for being here. And thank uh, you, thank you for, the, for the ELA Area Library. Okay. So if you didn't awkward part that we cut off, post the video.